Welcome to Nature Days. I'm Brianne, and today we're going to talk about reptiles and amphibians. These are two groups of animals that people often mix up. They do have some similarities, but we'll talk about what makes them different as well, and about some of the types of each that you might find around this area. Both reptiles and amphibians are cold-blooded. This doesn't mean that they're cold if you touch them. It means that their body temperature varies with the temperature of their surroundings. This is different than warm-blooded animals, which have roughly the same body temperature all the time, like you. Reptiles and amphibians also both hatch from eggs, although their eggs vary quite a bit. Reptile eggs have a tough, leathery covering, keeping them from drying out inside and allowing them to be laid on the land. Amphibian eggs, on the other hand, are usually laid in the water and are softer, almost jelly-like. Amphibians usually spend at least part of their life cycle, which includes metamorphosis, in the water, while reptiles are more suited for life on land. This doesn't mean there aren't exceptions. Some reptiles do spend their time in the water. Reptiles have scales to protect them, while amphibians have thin, delicate skin that they can breathe through. Now to talk about some types of reptiles. What do you think when you hear reptile? Maybe snakes? Or alligators or crocodiles? Or turtles? Maybe lizards? We have all of those in Pennsylvania, <laughs> except for the alligators and crocodiles. But let's talk about snakes first. A lot of people are scared of snakes, but snakes are a good thing to have around. They keep down the number of rodents and are an important part of the ecosystem. If you remember what we talked about last week, they are important in keeping things in balance. Most snakes are not aggressive either. You are much bigger than they are, so they're going to be scared of you and just want to be left alone. The eastern garter snake is one of the most common snakes you might see. Their colors can vary quite a bit and they can grow to a bit over two feet long. Interestingly, the eggs of these snakes hatch inside the mother's body, so they basically have live births. Another of the most common snakes is the black rat snake. They are good swimmers and climbers and can reach up to six feet in length. A quick note, all snakes can swim. A lot of people think that if they see a snake in the water, it's a venomous water moccasin, but this is not true. We don't even have water moccasins in Pennsylvania. This next snake isn't quite as common as the previous two, but it's so interesting that I wanted to share it with you. This is the eastern hognose snake. You can see the little upturned snout. But instead of hiding or trying to escape when threatened, these snakes will play dead. That's right, this snake isn't dead, it's just faking in hopes that it'll be considered unfit for eating and left alone. Now, people are always curious about venomous snakes. A quick note here, many people call them poisonous, but the word poisonous means that its toxins are going to harm you if you eat it. Venomous creatures, on the other hand, are ones that inject their toxins by biting or stinging. So they're not poisonous snakes, they're venomous snakes. And we have three of them in Pennsylvania. Some things that they have in common that make them easier to identify are triangular shaped heads and vertical slit pupils. This isn't the case for all venomous snakes everywhere, but it's helpful for knowing ours. These three snakes are the northern copperhead, timber rattlesnake, and eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. The only one you might run into around here is the northern copperhead. The timber rattlesnake is found in some of our surrounding areas, but it keeps to more mountainous habitat. You're not going to find it west of the Laurel Highlands in Pennsylvania. The eastern Massasauga rattlesnake prefers grasslands, marshes, and swamps, and is also found in some surrounding areas, but it is endangered and only currently existing in a few select spots. Now, as for copperheads, for what it's worth, I've spent a lot of time hiking out in the woods over the years, and I've still not ever run into a northern copperhead. But they tend to prefer old abandoned foundations, rock walls, and rocky hillsides, so it's worth being aware if you're around those types of environments. They'll often freeze in place when startled, so if you see one, just give it plenty of space. It won't bite you unless you get too close. I wish I had more time to talk about our snakes because they are so misunderstood by so many people and they're such fascinating animals. But we need to move on to lizards. Pennsylvania has only six lizards and only two of them live around here. These are the common five-line skink and the eastern fence lizard. Neither of these grow much beyond seven inches in length. Our last group of Pennsylvania reptiles are turtles and we have 15 of these. 
A lot of turtles spend a lot of time in the water, but one that spends its time on land is the eastern box turtle. These grow up to about 8 inches, but can live for over 100 years. They are species of special concern because their numbers have been dropping. A lot of this is due to habitat loss, but people picking them up for the pet trade also has an impact. So if you ever see one of these turtles, or any other turtle, please leave it there. The Ladaidami Nature Center in North Park has been raising some of these turtles to add to our existing population. Here are some cute pictures of the baby turtles from a couple years ago. Now on to the amphibians. Did you know that Pennsylvania has a state amphibian? Did you know that it's the eastern hellbender? The hellbender is the largest salamander in the United States, growing up to 29 inches. It needs very clean, swift running water, so its presence in an area is a good indicator of water quality. The hellbender is just one of Pennsylvania's 23 salamanders. Most of them don't spend all of their time in the water like the hellbender, but they do like wet habitats. A couple of the more common salamanders you might see are the spotted salamander and the long-tailed salamander. I've seen both of these in my yard under rocks and bricks. The red spotted newt is also pretty common, with distinct color variations between the juveniles and adults. Did you know that salamanders have a larva stage, just like the tadpoles of frogs and toads? They often look very similar, but the salamanders will have external gills that you can see, and their front legs develop first, unlike frogs and toads in which the back legs develop first. As for frogs and toads, we have 17 of them. One of them that I see pretty frequently in my yard is the Eastern American toad. These toads are pretty common around here. This footage is of one I happened to see while walking up a pathway. Please excuse the fact that I forgot to turn my phone horizontal. <laughs> a few of the common frogs you might see are the bullfrog and the green frog, which tend to be found around water. Another common frog is the northern spring peeper, although you are much more likely to hear them than to see them. They spend most of their time on land, blend in very well, and only grow to about an inch in length. This is surprising considering how loud their call is. Recognizing the call of the string peeper and our other frogs and toads is key in this week's citizen science project. Because frogs and toads call during their mating seasons, and because many are hard to actually see due to their camouflage and the times of day they may be active, Frog Watch USA asks you to track your observations based on hearing their calls rather than making visual observations. You do have to go through a training for this and your observation should be made during evenings from February through August. So at this point, if you're interested, you're gonna be planning for next year. This is more involved than most of the other citizen science projects we've discussed, but if you are interested in ABLE, it's a great one to participate in. Frog and toad numbers around the United States and around the world have been dropping, so it's very useful to scientists to know which species are still present in which areas. But if you want to get a head start on learning those calls, or if you just want to learn more about some of the reptiles and amphibians we talked about today, or all of those we didn't have time to cover, the Pennsylvania Herp Identification website is an amazing resource. Herpetology is a study of reptiles and amphibians, so sometimes people will call them herps when grouping them together. The website has profiles on each species present in Pennsylvania, along with pictures, information, and maps of the counties in which they have been seen. The frog and toad pages also have their calls. The location information is based on the Pennsylvania Amphibian and Reptile Survey, which started in 2013 and is ongoing. You can always submit your observations to that website. It's a great way to contribute if you're interested in reptiles and amphibians, but find Frog Watch too much of a commitment. We've barely scratched the surface on reptiles and amphibians today, but I hope you learned something and are inspired to learn something more about these amazing creatures, or maybe to at least be a little less scared of snakes. All of these animals are important pieces of their ecosystems and really help us by keeping other species like rodents and insects in balance. So the next time you see a herp, I hope it brings you a smile. And don't forget to report it to the Pennsylvania Amphibian and Reptile Survey. Happy Nature Days!